been far too long. Thank you for having me here. And I'm very, very proud of all that you've been able to achieve and, and so forth. And in the audience, welcome very, very much to Conversations. A dear friend, personal, and uh, uh, one of great respect uh, being uh, Norton, uh, Dr. Norton Mizminski. He is or was a, um, he was the distinguished, the distinguished pre uh, professor of history at the Connecticut State University. Uh, a title uh, that is uh, a great honorific, and also he's now emeritus in that role. But he's now the president of the Council on Middle East Studies. International Council for Middle East Studies. Council, uh, International Council for Middle East Studies that's located in Washington, D.C. now. Spends his time between New York, and uh, he's a real true scholar of great output and, uh, and also insight. And so, Norton, so good to see you. Welcome very, very Thank much you. to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Now, you've written a great deal, and I know you've had a great deal of attention. Uh, I wonder maybe your general thought, because you've had a great deal of, uh, you've given a great deal of attention to the Middle East and to issues that are involved in that part of the world and so forth. And we've had all these issues roiling it over these last couple of months from Tunisia on. What do you think, what, how do you, t how are you uh, receiving the information that's coming at such such a rapid pace and such a transformative pace in that region, uh, given your historical understanding of the the uh, cultural, political, economic roots of that part of the world, we're probably coming into a new era. Okay, when people who have been downtrodden and oppressed in various ways, mm -hmm. uh, politically, economically. And then, uh, well, in, in many ways, when those people, uh, highlighted by the younger generation, mm -hmm. is now reacting against autocratic rulers and autocratic leaders. Why now? We have a phrase in Yiddish, gut vase, God well, that's knows. Right. Go away. You told me that. Yeah, yeah. Who <laughs> no. knows? No. Why now? Uh, well, uh, as, I, as I just underlined, uh, to some extent, the younger generation is responsible, and they have some tools that we didn't are have. relatively new yeah, that right. we didn't have. Right. They have the technological tools. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. The other thing is that I suppose it's like um, a very big pressure cooker uh, when autocratic rulers have for so long in various ways oppress people that then uh, the pressure builds up and up and up and at some point it's going to blow. I guess there's been writing about that in historical terms of major movements of, uh, that occur historically, pressures build and so forth. And then autocratic. How do we define autocratic? Well, um, or does autocratic relate in any kind of a way to, in a generic sense to um, authoritarian, or and does that relate to plutocratic in terms of the political organization of the various cultures of the world? Well, first of all, uh, when we talk about the Middle East, or any part of the world for yeah, that matter, yeah. but it's the Middle East that we're talking about, uh -huh. um, uh, we know that in different places, in different countries, mm -hmm. there are similarities, but there are also differences, mm -hmm. so that autocratic rule, which is dictatorial rule, mm -hmm. uh, to one extent or another, mm -hmm. uh, it's going to vary. It's going to vary uh, in uh, substance. It's going to vary um, uh, you know, to one extent in one place and to another extent in another place. Mm -hmm. But what it means is that um, uh, few people, and sometimes fewer and fewer, are the ones who uh, acquire the power, they also acquire, uh, they acquire money, uh, and they then oppress in various ways and have oppressed their populations. Now again, that varies tremendously from one place to another, but now we're getting um, uh, explosions that are breaking through the surface in one country after another. Okay, yeah, we, we, you said we're, 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 limp, we're, we're talking about the Middle East. You are a historian of that area, and you have particularly, I know, great attention to 
the country of Syria. I know you've done that. We've done programs in the past interested in the uh, Palestinian question and all those kind of things. But I was also, I guess I was applying it on a world order, or I was just trying to, we're talking about that, but just for a moment, just taking it in a world order, that um, uh, all political entities, it seems to me, are at least plutocratic in terms of economic wealth and uh, power and influence, it seems to me, including the United States of America. I don't know, well, uh, it, it's plutocratic, there's a few people, it seems always in history there's been a few people who will rule in a certain geographical area, uh, whether it's the emperors of Rome or the feudal kings of Europe or now we have uh, industrialized bankers and so forth, and they can do it with varying degrees of some nodding to the to the population, but it seems to me that's just characteristic of history. Of, it, it, there's a distinction between those that give some idea that there's some meaning in terms of the masses, but on the whole, you got a small group of people who run things in, and, 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 and have economic power, political power, in virtually every political entity in the, on the planet. To some extent that may you be true. Yeah. To some extent that may be and probably has been true. <clears throat> but we have to guard against <clears throat> overgeneralizing and viewing this kind of thing as monolithic. And we also have to guard against being absolute about any theories of history. Yeah, um, I guess, yeah. Theories yeah. are uh, not only difficult, but I would say impossible really uh, to uh, prove theories of history over long periods of time right. are, it seems to me, not possible really to prove. We can say there are similarities. It's like, Harold, it's like yeah. searching for the truth. Yeah. My grandmother always delighted <laughs> in telling Yiddish proverbs, yeah. and she had a proverb yeah. that she told us often about the, the truth. Uh -huh. The truth is not alive. The truth is not dead. The truth struggles. Okay, that's Now, it. that tells like us something. That. I like that. Can, right. you, can you send me a chapter and verse uh, on that, <laughs> yes. would you please? And that, I'll that, even send you the Yiddish itself thank you. and the translation. Thank you, with the way of pronouncing. With the translation. With the pro way yes. of pronouncing, so okay. I can say it right yes. already, all right? <laughs> so I want to promise right. her that. But I, because I like, as you know, Bucky Fuller, and he used to say the universe is synergetic. Behavior systems unpredicted by the sum of the parts, if you put that in time, there are things that we can't know and that it will be only as we get there that we can know. So it's synergetic and it's un knowable in any fun there are no fundamentals in fact we can that applies also, to science and everything in yeah. fact we or might geography they we might geography. also yeah. say or i'll suggest yes. that we know there are some people who think they can know the truth yeah. and they do know the truth that's dangerous and that's extremely, extremely dangerous, dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> right the fundamentalists yeah right. and there are no fundamentalists in i mean in a certain sense in universe and everything like that and so all of that is there so when i try to make a distinction between autocratic and then you've got uh, autocratic light, and it's just manipulation and all that kind of stuff with media manipulation and these things. There are various ways in which it's done. Uh, do the things that are going on in the Middle East, North Africa and so forth, have effect? And what is the effect? What's the relationship to broader areas of the world, including, let's say, perhaps in the ultimate expression, the United States of America? Well, first of all, we know definitely that um, various happenings do affect the United States. And we also know that the United States, like it or not, mm -hmm. is still a superpower, perhaps still, as it's measured, the superpower of the world. And we know that the United States, again, in ways that we either like or in ways that we do not like sometimes, mm -hmm. the United States also affects these other parts of the world. And the United States, and that means both policies and actions mm -hmm. of the United States, often affect what's going on in other places and what has built up to make the conditions such that things such as is happening now do seem to start to explode in various places. In other words, uh, uh, what's happening in the Middle East, yeah, let yeah, us say, yeah, yeah, yeah. certainly affects the United States. And we can also say that what the United States has done and is still doing affects, affects. those places. Yeah. 
I quote a thing. I saw a quote in Nietzsche. He said, the, the, the future affects the present as much as the past. Do you think we're more anchored to the past, reifying institutions, and we have a harder time? Or do, how does the future affect the present uh, in terms of uh, policy decisions or broader patterns that we can see evolving politically and so forth in this uh, March uh, 31st of the year 2011? Let me tell you why it's difficult for me to answer that question. Mm. When I was in graduate school yeah, many, okay. many years ago, year many answer. years ago, <laughs> yeah, when yeah. I was in graduate school, yeah. my major professor, mm -hmm who was a great historian, yeah. always used to shake his finger in the face of those of us who were studying under him yeah. to become historians, yeah. and he said, historians are not prophets. Ah, okay. Yeah. I've never forgotten that. Okay, yeah. But that mm. doesn't mean that I don't reflect upon what may happen in the future anyway. Yeah, right, you see. right. Yeah. But uh, there's a danger. It's hard for us to know. Uh -huh what will happen in the future, uh, but it's not so difficult to know that when we have things going on, such as those things that are now going on in major ways in the Middle East, it's not difficult to know or to make an educated guess that certainly that is going to affect the future just as that is affecting the present. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, maybe we could look. Well, I, as you know, over our association for quite a while, my, my main man is Bucky Fuller. I love Bucky Fuller, comprehensive thinker, McLuhan, some of those. I like an economic system and so forth. I've been very disturbed over what's been going on in the country of Libya. I don't know if you've been following that or not or want to have any comment. We don't have to go there, but we do want to get to the country of Syria, if we can, with you, because you have special understanding of that, I do know. Well, I... I and my group, the International Council for Middle East Studies, among other co uh, countries with which we've been concerned, we certainly have been concerned with Syria. And in the last, I'd say, three to four years, I've devoted a good deal of attention to Syria, just as I have uh, mainly to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Yes. And so I would say that in Syria, we also have some unfortunate developments now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I must say that uh, I am uh, unhappy to being very unhappy yeah. uh, with what the present situation is. There are people uh, that uh, have been killed, not mm -hmm. nearly so many that uh, have been and are being killed in other places, mm -hmm. but there are people that have been killed, and there has been conflict between um, the government, uh, between... Uh, the uh, military force of the government and uh, uh, individuals who are demonstrating and who are protesting. Uh, and that's happening in a country that uh, in many ways I like and I respect. And I would say that uh, in Syria uh, uh, it's extraordinarily complicated if we, uh, in terms of trying to get to um, uh, the cause of that, and especially uh, to lay the blame. Uh, we have to lay the blame upon the government and even upon the President Bashar Assad, mm -hmm. whom I personally like in mm -hmm. many ways okay. to some extent. Uh, we have to lay the blame probably upon others. We don't know enough of the facts yet. Uh -huh. uh, but the situation is that in some places in Syria, some of the cities, uh, there have been and there are protests and demonstrations. Protests and demonstrations about what? Protests and demonstrations that uh, are demonstrations against uh, the kinds of restrictions upon various freedoms that have existed within Syria. Mm -hmm. Those restrictions are not so severe as they are in some uh, other countries in the same area, mm -hmm. but they have still been severe. There are demonstrations against that, and uh, even though we've had in the last two to three weeks, we've had some promises that have been aired that uh, many of these restrictions would be lifted or would be eased, uh, to date, that has not happened uh, to any uh, measurable extent. 
Will that happen? I'm hopeful that it will, and I'm hopeful that Bashar Assad, the president, uh, will do what others in his government have said that he will do. I think he's smart enough to do it. Uh, I think that he actually uh, is uh, sufficiently moral to do it. I think that he's different than his father was, mm -hmm. his father Hafez al-Assad, al who was, I think, uh, more, far more authoritarian, uh, probably uh, far less inclined to, uh, to lift these uh, <coughs> points of oppression. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And he had a, uh, with, with Islamicists, there was a put down. In the 80s, it was that there was a put down that took a well, great, got a great deal of attention because it became very widespread and well. Uh, not only a put down, searing, yeah. Not only a put down. Hafez al Assad literally killed some tens of thousands of people. Tens of thousands. Well, I think it was twenty. Uh, twenty. I saw. I 20. think it was twenty thousand. Yeah, that's a lot. That, that, that's that's real serious. Yeah, and it was Islamist threat. It was uh, well. Um, is it relevant? Uh, no. yeah, no. uh, uh, that's difficult to answer. Okay. Probably it was. It was not. No. Sir, it was not really uh, a fight that. It was not primarily a fight that way. Syria has been for a long time in terms of the government. Yeah. Um, uh, even though there are various Islamic sects, and also there uh, has been. It's now smaller, but there has been a significant Christian minority. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in Syria. Mm. And there was a there was a good Jewish community as well in Syria, mm -hmm. up until um, the 50, 1950s and into the 60s. Uh, but uh, the government's been largely a sectarian state, and even and the conflicts between Muslim groups, Islamic groups, and the con and then conflicts between Christians and Muslims, and even conflicts between Christians and Jews mm -hmm. in. <coughs> that was not. That's not really been the problem in Syria that it's been in other countries. What's the problem in Syria? The problem in Syria is a problem of individuals and groups that are in conflict with one another for a variety of reasons, struggling for some political power, there are some religious overtones, but let me tell you how it's exaggerated. Okay. Uh, the Assad family, that's ru they've ruled Syria now for decades. Okay. Hafez Assad, now Bashar Assad. Mm -hmm. They come from uh, uh, an Islamic group called the Alawites. Yes. The Alawites are an offshoot of the Shiites, and the Sunnis, the largest Islamic group, is, is and has been the majority. There are some people who have said that, well, it's because... Uh, of that, and it's because um, here the Alawites not only were the not only was Haf, was Hafez al Assad and Bashar al Assad the president uh, from the Alawite sect, but there were also others who were top people in the government who were of the Alawite sect, and they wanted to maintain their sect being uh -huh. on top, and uh -huh. so on. That's an exaggeration. Ha yeah. Was there some worry that? Uh, uh, both of the Assads and others may have had mm. about um, some problems that their sect would have? The answer is undoubtedly yes. Mm, yeah. But that was not really a major problem. Yeah. Um, uh, so what I'm doing is I'm discounting that. Okay. I'm saying that sometimes, as we know, in countries, uh, those people who come to the top and become the rulers mm -hmm. in order to maintain their power mm -hmm they become more autocratic, and by that I mean they begin to limit freedom, especially freedoms, especially freedom of expression, uh. more than uh, should be done in any uh, relatively democratic, or I would say even relatively humanitarian country. Uh. Has that happened in Syria? That's happened to some extent in Syria. Uh -huh. I say to some extent, it's happened in Syria more than in some other places, but far less than in some other places. What do you think is to be the outcome of what's going on now? He just gave a talk to the country. I understood that a number of the people thought he might lift the emergency decrees. And, and he so didn't on. really he lift did not them. do no. it. What is the effect 
Uh, there were people in Latakia or something. La a city. La Latakia and the other were, city is Dara, where people were killed. Actually were killed. killed in killed. some size. There were some number. about well, 60, 70. That's real numbers in a way. In They're a real numbers. Sense. We're not talking thousands or tens that's of thousands or hundreds that's true. of thousands. Hard. Yeah, we could get and back. and um, uh, I have my doubts mm -hmm. that the order to do that came from Assad himself. Could have come from, uh, it yeah. could have come from uh, some of the people who uh, yeah. who are who are uh, in command of some of the uh, police and yeah. troops yeah. 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 and probably a bit too much power was given to them to do those kinds Autonomous of things. Autonomous power that That's they right. could act upon that with they initiative. Could act yeah, upon yeah, yeah, that, yeah, right. Well, that, that of course, we a, don't know that yeah, definitely. Again. We'll know it sometime probably, uh -huh. but we don't know it now. Yeah, okay. Uh, but if you're asking me what I think, what I would guess, even though I've said historians are yeah, not right. prophets, <laughs> what, what I guess advice? would be, I would, uh, my guess is, knowing something about Syria, that, um, uh, that that will be lessened and probably stopped to a great extent and that uh, Bashar Assad himself, although he did not lift the emergency yeah. laws as people thought he would mm -hmm. yesterday, I think that uh, he himself will lessen that and he is still uh, the person in control and in power. Uh -huh. um, and I think that he will do that. You think he will? I hope he will. Yeah. And I and yes, on balance, I think he will. Am I sure? I can't be sure. No, because God boost. How uh, do you say? Gut vase. God vase. Okay, <laughs> I got to get this down. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to take chapter and verse from you. Everything like that, because we see what's going on in Libya, which has been a response on the part of the Western powers and so forth. Uh, Hillary Clinton said she thought he's able to come around to seeing things in the right way, Mr. Assad, and so forth. So one wonders because they shifted. They used to support Mubarak, and then when there got to be big crowds, they shifted. And you got Bahrain. They got a different attitude toward that. What do you think about the attitude of the Obama administration, the American administration, and the, uh, in terms of dealing with the situation that's emerging with the Arab Spring? Uh, well, um, I'm not overly happy. Uh, with it or about it. Yeah. Uh, first of all, Another we can, war. first of all, um, in many ways, it's been hypocritical. Oh yeah. Now, but I, but we have to remember that hypocritical policy of the United States government in the Middle East, elsewhere too, but in the Middle East, is certainly not limited to the Obama administration. In other words, Absolutely. the hypocrisy yeah. has mm. been there for a very long time, uh, for at least a few decades. But there has been hypocrisy, and you put your finger on it. Let's take some other places um, uh, other than uh, Syria and or Libya. Mm -hmm. um, let's take uh, Bahrain. Mm -hmm. uh, let's take even Tunisia, mm -hmm. where uh, let's take Iraq. Mm -hmm. Before the decision was yeah. to go in and to uh, smack Saddam Hussein, mm -hmm. which wa who was a very oppressive ruler, mm -hmm. it's the United States government, after all, mm -hmm. that armed these people, yeah. that supported these people, that worked to keep them in power. Mm -hmm. Now, with Saddam Hussein, it was not Obama, because that was before Saddam Hussein. Mm -hmm. But if we go to Egypt, for example, well, certainly for a very long time, Supported that Mubarak. is for, for that, there was great support for Mubarak, and there billions, was great support. Billions, billions, yeah. Uh, well, you know, it was, it's pretty amazing, Harold. Second uh, after, Israel. Yes, mm. well, uh, uh, I mean, not only support for Egypt, but uh, we learned in the last few weeks since uh, this um, uh, uprising occurred in Egypt, we learned that Hosni Mubarak mm -hmm. 
was one of the very few wealthiest people in the world. Yep, right. And he was one of the wealthiest people in the world because he obviously took the money off the top in his country. Mm -hmm. And his country has not has the largest population in the Arab Middle East. Mm -hmm. It now has 80 to 85 million, probably 82 to 83 million people. Mm -hmm. The estimate is that over 50% of them are at or below the line of subsistence. Yes. And that... 30% at least are in dire poverty, and that's been the case for quite a long time, mm -hmm. and the population is growing at the rate of 1 million every 10 months, mm -hmm. and here, mm -hmm. given such a poor country yeah. with so many people, mm -hmm. we then find that this ruler who has been supported by the United States, yeah. that, 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 that he has become yeah. one of the wealthiest people in the world, mm -hmm. well, that can only mean one thing. And what that can mean is he took that money off the top mm -hmm. from his people, many of whom are well below the line of subsistence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, that, how can mm -hmm. one not, mm -hmm. if one is humanitarian, mm -hmm. how can one not condemn that? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we can say, well, to some extent, perhaps indirectly the united states government was concerned was was uh, was responsible because the united states government up until these recent last weeks mm -hmm. was fully supportive of mubarak yeah. and mubarak not only stole money mm -hmm. mubarak also was extremely oppressive uh, and he was very repressive in terms of personal freedoms of expression. Mm -hmm. you, except for a few people who had some power themselves, mm -hmm. uh, if you were uh, someone who spoke out against Mubarak, you uh, would probably be rounded up and jailed or worse. Yeah, 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 that's right. Now, the United States government support, that then, and all the time saying, that uh, this government saying that uh, we, the United States government, support democracy yeah, right. and we support morality. Well, how democratic was that support? Yeah, yeah. How moral was that support? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hypocrisy runs very deep. And that's Mubarak. Yeah. Now, we could go to some other places. If we go to a country like that is Saudi a major, Arabia. that's right, yeah. that's a major that's country that it, hasn't, yeah. that it hasn't exploded yet. But if we go there, well, we know that oil is a big factor there. Absolutely. But a big factor or not, mm -hmm. we have supported one of the most hypocritical regimes uh, with one of the most hypocritical societies uh, socially and other ways yeah. mm -hmm. uh, in the world. Yeah. That's Saudi Wahhabi. Arabia. Yeah, right. That's like, Saudi Arabia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've done it. We just gave them billions, tens of billions of dollars just recently in weapons that we've given it's to them and supporting new. them. It's and we've been new. doing that. In the case of Mubarak, we did it, uh, the second largest recipient of aid next only to Israel. And if we, so and if we would look at Israel mm -hmm. for a while, yeah. then, 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 the, then the hypocrisy is as plain as anything could be mm. uh, in terms of uh, uh, on, 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 a on a big level, on a very large level, and on a smaller, more, on a smaller, more specific levels as well. Uh, that question has been in the front burner for a long time, the situation uh, between Palestine, Israel, what's going on there, the Middle East problem. It could be seen as the flashpoint of the world. Where does it stand? What does it mean in terms of that lingering and that continuing to uh, plague uh, consciousness and so forth, the situation as far as the Middle East peace process uh, that uh, we gave so much support, give and continually give so much support to Israel and give so much support to uh, Egypt and Mubarak uh, because he was able to be in a certain sense bought off in terms of that relationship, it seems. We started so to give Where the does all that go? We could get over well, to we the started to give Is it still the major issue in the e region, the Palestinian issue, or how does it uh, affect by these uh, developments of this uh, Arab Spring? In the Middle East, we have for decades had a great many conflicts. Yeah. Uh, and um, up until recently, even including now, the Arab-Israeli, or more specifically, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, 
was not one of the conflicts in which the most people were killed and wounded. Mm. For, exa mm. for example, the war between Iran and Iraq that, that lasted, that's right, that oh. lasted for eight yeah. and a half years Horrible. in yeah. the 1980s, there were uh, hundreds and thousands more time people killed yeah. and so on. Horrible. But, but Horrible. having said that, yeah. having said that, since 1948, when the state of Israel came into existence, mm -hmm. the Arab-Israeli conflict, or as I said, more specifically, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, mm -hmm. has been the single most consistent conflict in the Middle East mm -hmm. that has, up until right now, in terms of what's going yeah, on right, right now, right, right. that up until uh, this last few months, that's the conflict that has affected all the rest mm -hmm. of the Middle East, mm -hmm. whereas the other conflicts have not quite done that. The war between Iran and Iraq, well, that was limited mostly, if not almost solely, to Iran and Iraq, Kissinger as bad said, as it was. Kissinger said, let them kill that's each other, well, I believe. I'm not sure if he was quoted, but it, yeah. That, that's well, it's not mm. only Kissinger. Mm. Mm. Uh, during the midst of that war, um, the Prime Minister of Israel mm. came to this country, and not only the Prime Minister, but other leaders were on Face the Nation once, and, oh. and the Prime Minister was asked, well, what about this? What about Iran and Iraq? And what about the rumors that Israel indirectly, that means the United States indirectly, right, right. Uh, is arming both sides? Uh -huh. Because Israel would get weaponry from the United States well, and would then give the weaponry to sell it to Iran and Iraq for profit. Well, they're doing the same thing with Saudi Arabia okay. and Israel now. But when yeah. asked about it, what was the answer? And the people getting rich. What was born. the answer? Uh, the answer was, well, it's been good for us, the mm. Israeli government, the Israelis, financially. Mm. But more than that, both the both Iran and Iraq are our enemies, mm. so if our enemies are fighting and killing mm -hmm. one another, that's not bad for yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. They well, did it. Uh, on the how do you like that yeah, as uh, a humanitarian answer? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, wh what about, the, what about the, the relevance of it and the relevance of current activity or things that are going on and that issue? Uh, uh, there, somebody said, let's have a fly, uh, no-fly zone over uh, Gaza. Because we killed 1,400 people, or Israel did. Maybe we should import, uh, uh, because they're uh, killing civilians in uh, overwhelming power and all the rest of the argumentation vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Tripoli versus Benghazi and so forth. We should have a no-fly zone over Gaza. It's a joke, but, uh, you know. Well, well it's a where joke. Does that, where does that whole issue s stand? Is Listen, it what the let, people let, is let me put it to you this way. How are people taking all, right. all of this in the country of Israel? What's the feeling? What's the implications in terms of a two state or what are we going to have in terms of some sort of a final solution in, in that air area? Let's start with solution. <coughs> we are today, I'm not not just suggesting, yeah. I'm maintaining. Yeah. We are today probably further away from a settlement than we have been even in the past. And, in the, and we never have been close. Mm -hmm. we, we've had this term for this conflict, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We've had this term peace process yeah. used continually mm -hmm. since the Oslo Agreement in 1993. Right. The Oslo Agreement was not something that initiated or started any kind of peace process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have not really had a peace process since for a whole variety of reasons. But we're probably further away today than we were before. And let me, I could, I, that can be illustrated uh, on many levels with many specifics, but let me take one specific. Okay. And um, uh, there has been a lot of talk for a long time about a two-state solution. Mm -hmm. And the United States government also keeps saying it favors a two-state solution. Right. And we've Abdullah even, plan. And yeah. we've even had mm -hmm. the Israeli government mm -hmm. since the time of the Oslo Agreement, since mm -hmm. after the Oslo Agreement, even up to the present government, 
Even Ariel Sharon before and now Netanyahu, mm. they say, well, sometime in the future, even they have a vision of a two-state solution. But here's the problem. The settlements go no, on. Not, not, no, not just the settlements. Right. Here's, here's, here's the bigger blanket problem. Okay. When the Palestinians talk about a Palestinian state, mm -hmm. the ones who talk about a two-state solution, mm -hmm. when they talk about a Palestinian state, in, for them it would be now the West Bank and Gaza, for those who talk about this. Yeah. They're talking, as we can understand, about an independent, sovereign state. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. When the Israeli government, has There's talked no since active. 1993 mm -hmm. about a Palestinian state. Because they have overwhelming They are power. talking mm -hmm. about an autonomous state. Uh -huh. And that term is a term that Menachem Begin, mm -hmm. who was the Prime Minister of Israel mm -hmm. then, mm -hmm. he coined that at the end of the 1970s. Mm -hmm. And that's been the Israeli definition since. And this is what it means. Mm -hmm. That means that if it comes about, if, the Palestinians can have a state in those areas of the territories occupied since 67 that Israel decides they can have, uh -huh. which will only be a portion of it, uh -huh. and they can have their state, which means they can have their own police, they can have their own schools, they can have their own social systems, they will have to provide their own services, mm -hmm. and they can do that until and unless they are doing some things the Israeli government doesn't like, mm -hmm. and then the Israeli government will come in and stop them with overwhelming force. So which that, they have. Which they have. Mm -hmm. So that means that for the, the, that the Israeli definition has been an autonomous state. That means sovereignty is still and still rests in the hands of the Israelis. Mm -hmm. Well, those are two opposite definitions of state. Palestinians who want the two-state solution don't accept this, the autonomous thing at all. The Israeli government has never even suggested. They have never even wanted the term sovereignty to be put on the table for discussion mm -hmm. in any kind of discussion in the, for the future of a two-state solution. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying that they don't even agree they totally disagree on the definitions, what the words mean, yeah. what, the, on, what, what the words mean and what they want mm -hmm. to put into, a, into effect. Yeah. And the situation is that since 1967, mm -hmm. when we had the 67 war mm -hmm. and Israel took these territories, right, right. gave the Sinai back to Egypt because it got a good deal, mm -hmm. but it, uh, it kept the Golan, uh, mm -hmm. of course, from Syria, but it kept the West Bank and Gaza since that time, we've had one state, and that one state has been, it, it's the state of Israel mm -hmm. plus the occupied territories. Mm -hmm. We've had one state, and the reality is that the Israelis have embedded that one state even more. It's more of a one state today than it was before because we didn't have Jewish settlers in the West Bank before the June 67 war, right. and now we have 400,000 mm -hmm. plus, mm -hmm. and the Israeli government's not going to give that up, and we've had a lot of that land confiscated. Mm -hmm. So the, the one state is more of a one state now than it ever was before, and so what we now have, we have it to a very small extent in Israel with a few Israeli Jews who argue this. They're in a striking minority. Uh -huh. We have it with a growing number of Palestinians, even though they may not be in a, in a majority now. We have people who are saying, listen, the two-state solution is dead. Dead, dead. It was never a reality. Mm -hmm. We have one state. Mm -hmm. So let's have a one-state solution. And what that means is we have one state. So let's start to work and let's start to work for. Let's start to protest. Let's start to demonstrate. 
I would hope in nonviolent ways, that we make the one state a better one state. And let me suggest something. I'm not a Palestinian. Mm -hmm. Were I a Palestinian and were I in the West Bank and Gaza, mm -hmm. I would be saying to my brothers and sisters, listen, we have a very good human rights argument. We have a lot of human rights arguments. But one good human rights argument is we're the indigenous population that has been here for centuries. Mm -hmm. We are the majority, we're, we're the population anyway that have been occupied since 1967. Illegally uh, by international uh, uh, law? Occupied. Yeah. Since we've been occupied, yeah. we've never been allowed to become citizens. So we're saying we want to have our right of citizenship. Mm -hmm. That's what I would argue. In, that's, in, a, that's a pretty good argument. Now, the Israeli government's not giving it to them because that would mean another four million Palestinians are citizens, and that threatens the kind of exclusive Jewish state that exists. But I'm saying that if you want to argue for one state, start to argue on human rights grounds and try to build it that way. That would be a very slow process, but given the demography that exists, mm -hmm. given the area, mm -hmm. given the tiny percentage of the people in the whole area who are Jews, mm -hmm. given that the, Jew, the Israeli Jews have one of the lowest birth rates in the world mm -hmm. and the Relative Palestinians one the have one of the highest, uh -huh. and given that today, mm -hmm. that today, there are just about as many Palestinians in that one state mm -hmm. as there are Israeli Jews because we have to include the West Bank and Gaza. Mm -hmm. And tomorrow mm -hmm. and next year and more. the next generation there will be more. Mm -hmm. Then I would suggest that the long range view, and here I'm turning to being a prophet <laughs> again, yeah. the long mm -hmm. range view mm -hmm. is that that exclusivist Jewish Zionist state is in the future sometime doomed and the argument should be that Israeli Jews who are concerned as they should be for their security, mm -hmm. if they're really concerned for their security, they should give up the idea of an exclusive estate that by law grants rights and privileges to Jews not granted to non-Jews. It's like and apartheid. They should, that's right. They should think of having a more democratic state because that is what might guarantee their security in the long run. What prevents them from being able to do that? There's a long-standing uh, attitude on the part of many of the Jewish persuasion and so forth that anti-Semitism is built into the human condition root and branch and that uh, there will never be a possibility of security for the Jewish people unless they have total yes. security in a state of only their own because the world is anti-Semitic. To core. use it, to use a, to use a trite phrase, you hit it on the head. Mm. Zionist theory, the theory of political Zionism, mm -hmm. political Zionism, yeah. since Herzl and the early 1890s, Not to has mention been Hitler. Uh, all right, has been based. Mm. Has been based. Mm. It's, it, it has some complexities, mm -hmm. but the essence is simple, and the essence is based upon what you just suggested, an absolute theory of anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. why, why do I say absolute? The theory is Jews have been in the past and or are being in the present, whenever the present is, mm -hmm. and or will be in the future persecuted by non-Jews mm -hmm. in all nation states in which they are a minority. Right. That means anti-Semitism is absolute, mm -hmm. and so it follows from that. Then we get to the second point. The second point is Jews need a state of their own where they start out as the majority, Hope, if not of the, all the residents, then of the citizens who control the state, and they have to maintain themselves as the majority, because if they don't, then we go back to anti-Semitism. So that's an, and, the, and Israel was created in that image, has passed laws to maintain the control in the hands of the Jews. So you're right, that's the theory, and that is still, that is still the idea of the majority of, is, of Israeli Jews. Let me end it by saying, though, that in a rational sense, mm. it's totally, it, it's topsy-turvy. It's irrational. Why do I say that? Because this state of Israel has existed since 1948. 
for 62 to 63 years, it's been that kind of Zionist state where Jews are supposedly the safest, and it's the only safe place for Jews according to Zionist theory. Every year in the United States and elsewhere, when the state of Israel and its backers Aliyah. collect money oh. for the state of Israel, mm. what's their primary argument? Give support and money to Israel because the Jews in Israel are living in the most unsafe place for Jews in the whole world. Mm -hmm. Well, Harold, mm -hmm. it can't be the safest place over here and the most unsafe place over here. It can't be both at the same time. Uh -huh, it's a problem. What about in the case of the United States of America, or let's just say uh, uh, in the case of colonialism, um, uh, the Europeans came to the shores of, uh, of North America that had countries like Iroquois and so forth. And what happened is they either conquered them or they assimilated into the culture. Uh, the Palestinian could just assimilate and become Israeli citizens much the way the Mohawk and the Iroquois have become American citizens. Or is that something that is not possible? Well, Only first of all, of first of all, messianic uh, something that well, can yeah, happen. No. Yeah. First of all, we know that before the Mohawks and mm. the Iroquois and other Indian, they now use the term Native American tribes, yeah. before that happened mm -hmm. with some of them, mm -hmm. the majority of them were killed. I mean, <laughs> first we had, well, that, yeah. first we had that. Well, we're not having, we we're not having that. Uh, that's probably not going to occur. Now, could they become assimilated? No, not as long as we have a Zionist state. The Zionist state, built upon this theory of absolute anti-Semitism, that Zionist state will not, will not allow, because according to that theory, cannot really allow <coughs> this to happen, this to happen. Now, we then have another problem from the most religious of the Jews who believe uh, some other things that I, as a Jew, would say uh, are things that are pretty horrible, such as uh, not just the Jews are the chosen people of God to uh, spread the message to the whole world, yeah. uh, but uh, that the Jewish soul is superior to other souls, yeah. that Jews are closer to God than other people, yeah. that uh, uh, all of the Gentiles or the Goyim are uh, inferior to the Jews and uh -huh. so on and yeah, so yeah, forth. Yeah. Well, mm. there is that, mm. and then there's also this belief by traditionally religious Jews, mm. the belief that God gave Jews, Jews, mm. not others who might want to assimilate uh, into the state. Mm. God gave Jews an eternal deed, mm. an eternal deed to the Holy Land. Mm. And the Holy Land includes all of present day Israel and maybe a little more. Some, but some maps go to Ur, do Yes, they yes, but let's say it certainly includes all of present yeah. day Israel, mm -hmm. that God gave an eternal deed to the Jews and they mm -hmm. point mm -hmm. to passages in the Bible where there is that promise. God mm -hmm. promised, chapter 12 of the book of Genesis in Hebrew it's called Lech Lecha, mm -hmm. that means go out. Mm -hmm. God said to Abraham, go out and uh, uh, I'm going, I promise this land of Canaan, which is historic Palestine, that's this land that is the state of, of, of Israel. Uh, uh, the promise is to you and to your descendants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Of course, in the Quran, <laughs> it says the Jewish scribes cheated and the promise really went from Abraham to his other son Ishmael because Abraham was the father of the Arabs mm -hmm. so there you have it but I'm saying there it's pretty dangerous as we said before yeah. if people believe that they are the ones who have the word of God and that's what we call in Hebrew Torah min hashamayim that's the ultimate truth and they're acting upon that yeah uh, that's yeah. very dangerous yeah we started acting we started talking before about fundamentalism and when you start getting into spiritual things with things uh, Adam Smith was the golden tablet and all kinds of things that come up of a lot of the spiritual traditions which is really camouflage and cover for political uh, ascendancy of a particular group arguing for their, 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 their specialness almost as hard as the football team in the modern football Harold. league 
and terrible. that kind of thing. Terrible. We're number one, we're number one. That kind of thing it goes out as part of the national creed and that sort of thing uh, over there. But, I mean, uh, what, what do you think is going to be the reaction or the, the, uh, to that issue? That issue has been a major issue there, and there are people who think that not only Israel, but Israel's back, or the United States of America, is seen as a superpower, which it has emerged after the Second War with Britain and so after Britain and so forth, and that their, pow their idea that we got from uh, the Enlightenment and from the, our system and so forth is one that is historically legitimate. That order is what, legitimate. That the Israeli position and that, is... And, no, that, uh, the, the American given system that seems to have been adopted by much of the world, Soviet Union imploded, a Marxist challenge on a socialist vein and everything. The modern uh, image, that uh, the American image, is one that is historically legitimate. I know the people in uh, feudal Europe a thousand years after Rome thought that the crowned heads were legitimate in terms of the authority for a feudal order. And you had a new change coming in this country. Now that's there. And that order that we're wanting to assume on a world scale is being uh, questioned by many people that it does not have, uh, even though many have signed on to it, they become what the Marxists would call running dogs in terms of accepting our capitalist view of the world and so forth, that it's not adequate to what the future requires. There's a challenge coming. Is there a challenge coming uh, from... Um, from, uh, from, from, from the Islamic world, one quarter of the world population or not, uh, radical Islam or that kind of thing, and how does it relate when it sees us giving so unquestioned support, total support, to this bastion of uh, 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 a, 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 an ally of ours in the middle of all that area, uh, and what, what's the implications in terms of the uh, Islamic world, the Arabs, and then the Islamic world, particularly a lot of these street elements that are coming into some sort of, uh, they've been held in check by these autocrats and so forth. What's the implications in terms of Israel and the Palestine question, do you think? Big question. Uh, God-based? How, no, no, God, God God How do you say? God-based. God-based, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Mul no, but a, mul a multiplicity of answers. I mean, mm. that has to be approached in a good many ways. Mm. If you ask me what I think about our country, the United States, uh -huh. I would say that um, um, in as the carriers theory, of wait, historical wait, legitimacy, wait, wait, wait. in theory, uh, in theory, as opposed to practice, and in theory, it means uh, as uh, the government and the society was set up and still is in many ways. That is under our constitutional system. I would say that I w that uh, nothing is perfect democratically, yeah. but I would say that I'm a great advocate of that, mm -hmm. and that that is it seems to me relatively democratic. And I think that we have good principles that flow from that and have fl mm -hmm. and and have flowed from okay. that. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, mm -hmm. there are many times, including. Uh, the, few, uh, the, the present, mm -hmm. there are many times that policies and actions of the United States government are so hypocritical. That's are, are hypocritical and not and are effective. Not, and, uh, that's right, and I <coughs> would then say are negative. <coughs> so I'm saying that one part of the answer is I would be a big defender and I'm an advocate of the kind of system that we had installed and that still does really exist here, mm -hmm. even though I would be, I am, I should be, and I think others should be critics of the of some uh, many of the policies and actions of, we'll say, my government, uh, of the government of the United States. So I would say that's one part of the answer. And I think I can also say, since you, I, I can say this, I think, uh, mostly about the area of the world outside the U.S. that I think I know yeah. the best, the, mm -hmm. the Middle, Middle East. East yeah. I think this is true in other parts of the world as well, though. In the Middle East, if we're talking about, I, I'm now not talking about uh, the extreme Islamic militants. That's part. Such as Al-Qaeda. I'm, I'm going to hold that and talk about that in a minute. I'm talking about the great majority 
of people who are Muslim. We have what? We have 1.4, 1.5 billion Indian Muslims uh, in in this world. Yeah. And you know, uh, only a minor, only a small um, a minority of them are in the Middle East. Margaret but Mead said that only a small minority is anybody that moves anything. All right. In a major but I'm way. saying, listen. Though the people I know and come into contact with in various parts of the Middle East, yeah. they like Americans generally. Mm -hmm. They like the United States generally. What's not the they right? dislike mm -hmm. intensely mm -hmm. many of the actions of the United States government and many of the policies, the, uh, the bl almost blind support mm -hmm. for the state of Israel and for its oppressive policies, mm -hmm. that's a major part of it. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying there's also a division there. That is, if we ask, well, what are the reactions to and about the United States, those reactions vary. But the more that there are negative actions and negative policies uh, by the United States government, the more the antagonism will build to this country as a whole. Uh, uh, and the more there will be the possibility of radical Islamist kind of uh, proscriptions finding fertile ground. Well, that's possible. That's uh, well, uh, that that that's. You're right when you say possibly, and we can also That's say, well, we word, have had, yeah. we have had, we've seen some increase. We've seen an increase in that. Mm -hmm. So it's not only possible, but we can say that um, uh, if, again, we're, we put ourselves into the category of being prophets, oh, we can yes. say it's not only possible, mm -hmm. but it's probable. Uh, probable even now. Probable. Yeah. And as we do things that are building... Uh, inappropriately dealing with this situation, bombing here, not bombing there, this is that, then it's, uh, you know, going along with autocratic systems there, you know, and it's so hypocritical in a way, and it begins to drain us, and it begins to drain uh, our system uh, that the, uh, the legitimacy, the assumed legitimacy of the United States may unravel or the pattern that the United States has seen the leadership of the system and that there's a new system that's needed, something that's going to be subsuming of the old system that's out of date, like feudalism was out of date when we had the Enlightenment and so forth. That it, the system that's calling itself illegitimate, uh, le calling itself legitimate, walking with big league boots, putting its power into every part of the world without a vision adequate to liberation or what's needed in terms of the broader use of the, uh, the broader world society of humanity and the ecology, they don't have a vision adequate to uh, what the future requires and it would be superseded and people would be looking for that rather than just being cowed by the power of the Well, Western all power. of this is problematic. It does, it is. It does seem to me that um, it, it's clear that there is a lot of hypocrisy in uh, what our government ha keeps saying about democracy and yeah. what it's it has done, well, what it has done and is doing in various parts of the world. Um, and I don't think that uh, the United States of America uh, can save the whole of the world. On the other hand, it becomes complicated for me as I look at it yeah. because I still think that um, there is some mission for this country, yeah. while it is a strong power, mm -hmm to try to do something about uh, uh, helping uh, in certain parts of the world at certain times mm -hmm. and saving lives. Mm -hmm. I don't think that uh, we can help everywhere all the time and save all lives, mm -hmm. but uh, I also uh, do not believe that we should therefore just become totally isolationist mm -hmm. and say that we're not going to try to uh, stop uh, some oppression in some places of the world but when we do that, we had better be very careful about not being hypocritical in terms of uh, helping out over here 
against certain oppressors, but over here actually helping oppressors oppress their people. Yeah, yeah, that's a problem for sure, and that's a major one that confronts us. Norton, it's so good. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Really good to talk with you as always to get a lesson and get uh, caught up to date with a view of things. I. I think it's a amazingly pregnant time within a pregnant time. It's like the waters broke or water is breaking or something, and a major transformation is uh, uh